Dr. Chris Thornburg is the founder of Beacon Economics and an expert in economic and revenue forecasting, regional economics, and real estate markets. Today on Your Money, Your Wealth, Dr. Thornburg shares his opinions on the California and U.S. real estate markets, the economy, and tariffs, as well as the debt crisis he says we are facing in just 10 to 15 years. Plus, Joe Anderson CFP and Big Al Clopine CPA answer your money questions. Why is owning your own home considered profitable? Is it a good idea to buy rental real estate property in a self-directed IRA? And should you buy a fixed or fixed indexed annuity? Plus, rich dad, poor dad, my two dads, golf, and more in the derails. I'm producer Annie Last, and here with our guest, Dr. Chris Thornburg, our Pure Financial Advisors Director of Research, Brian Perry, CFP, CFA, and Big Al Clopine, CPA. Chris, uh, you're a noted economist. You know a lot about our economy. And I think I want to start with real estate because we're here in the local market in San Diego and we've got clients all around the country. But I, I kind of want to start in San Diego and Southern California, get some of your thoughts because we're starting to see articles. Uh, this is one that came out maybe a couple months ago by KGTV and here in San Diego. And they, here's the headlines. San Diego's housing market cooling down new report shows and it's it's talking about san diego ranked third on the list of housing markets seeing the biggest slowdown and the report shows that conditions in san diego market are favoring buyers more than they did a year ago more than 20 percent of homes for sale in san diego had a price cut in january 2019 so i would i'd love to start there and kind of get your thoughts on what's going on in real estate yeah, sure. I, I chuckled there because the idea that uh, California, anywhere in California, is a buyer's market is is sort of funny. Right. Uh, prices here, of course, are are astronomical compared to much of the United States, driven largely by, well, the lack of building. But the broader question about the health of the market, uh, I, you know, it certainly isn't just California that's seen this slowdown. If you look at the national sales, they sh slowed down pretty sharply at the end of last year, coming into the beginning part of this year. Price appreciation started to slow down as well. And uh, that combined with, I think, some of the broader fears of the health of the expansion, um, you had, of course, all those bears who've been hibernating for the last couple of years come out of their cave and start to predict doom and gloom uh, about the housing market. And, you know, it's it's understandable for people to channel, if you will, their inner great recession. It was only a decade ago when, of course, the real estate markets across the United States were in total shambles. But the idea that this is going to turn into a real estate route like we saw in 2008, 9, and 10 is really, it's on its face, why not? But when you dig a little deeper, you start to realize just how preposterous a forecast that would be. If you go back in time and you talk about what happened to real estate back at 8, 9, and 10, one thing to keep in mind is that was singularly unique. We've never seen a real estate collapse like that in the last 50, 60 years in the United States. That was unbelievably bad. It's really amazing. And you ask why? Well, there were three reasons. The first reason, of course, was there was a massive bubble going on driven by subprime credit. Subprime credit was driving prices, particularly in second tier markets. Think Inland Empire, suburban Phoenix, Vegas. Uh, it wasn't San Francisco, but those more secondary markets were exploding because so much funny money was driving the market to a crescendo that was completely not sustainable. The second big part of it had to do with the fact that uh, you had a massive amount of overbuilding in the United States. At the peak, we were building 2.1 million housing units per year vastly more than population growth would actually suggest we needed. And then last but not least, remember that households were borrowing tons of money and spending that money pretty rapidly. So you saw a very dangerous buildup in debt to income ratios, uh, even as uh, consumer savings rates fell. So you really had, uh, if you will, uh, that kind of perfect cocktail for just a massive meltdown, which is what we experienced. This time around, none of those factors are in play. We're not building too much nationally. We're certainly not building too much in California. Uh, if you think about the mortgage markets, mortgage credit has been growing at a very slow base, largely driven by the new rules passed under Dodd-Frank. And of course, the quality of that credit um, is better than it's ever been. The, over the last decade, the median credit score for a, a mortgage borrower has been well above 750. Uh, a decade ago and before that, it was around 700. 
And then last but not least, the household sector. There's no dangerous buildup from debt. Incomes are rising nicely. Again, you look across the board and, and what you see is one of the healthiest housing markets we've had in 40 years. So this is nothing more than a temporary blip driven by the temporary increase in mortgage rates last year. Well, guess what? Mortgage rates are back down again. Trust me when I say the second half of this year is going to be a great year for real estate. And for those of you sitting on the fence waiting for those big price declines, you're not going to see them. Well, and I think it's uh, important to note that you were one of the ones in probably 2005, 2006 that predicted the housing crash. And I find it very interesting and reassuring that uh, yeah. what you're saying is, is it seems like nothing of the same right now, which is great to hear. Uh, yeah. What does concern you, though, economy-wise? You know, it's not the short run. You know, uh, the short run economy is extremely healthy. What concerns me is the politics which are saying the exact opposite. I mean, if you go to Washington, D.C., if you go to Sacramento, California, you don't hear anybody talking about, okay, well, things are pretty good right now. Let's tackle some of these long-term challenges like educational reform or pension reform, entitlement reform, infrastructure investments. Instead, everybody in D.C. and Sacramento are in crisis mode. And, you know, all by itself, being in crisis mode when there isn't a crisis is a good way to pass bad policy. And that's exactly what you continue to see, um, is a lot of bad policy being passed. I mean, take, for example, the, the tax cut that happened at the end of 2017. That was horrible. <laughs> Why did we do it? We cut taxes and we increased government spending. We used fiscal stimulus in a late expansion full employment economy. I mean, the disconnect there from any macroeconomic policy standpoint is is really hard to get your hands wrapped around. But we went and passed fiscal policy and took a bad budget situation and made it that much worse. The United States borrowed well over a trillion dollars last year in order to backfill federal government spending because of those tax cuts. So because we're in a crisis mode, oh my God, the economy's bad, we have to have fiscal stimulus, we took a long-run problem and made that long-run problem, that is to say a lack of fiscal discipline, this ongoing deficit, and we made it worse. That's yeah. the kind of thing that scares me. Yeah, so let's chat about that. So clearly any kind of stimulus is going to help us in the short term, but what does that mean for us longer term? Well, you got to remember that the United States has made promises to seniors that we can't afford. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And, and we've been the, the kind the kind of hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil over the last couple decades on this issue. We're not talking about it. But the reality is now that boomers are starting to retire, you're going to see over the next 30 years an explosion in retired folks. According to the census, over the next decade, 22 million more Americans, of which 18 million are going to be 65 plus people who are drawing Social Security, people who are drawing Medicare. There's going to be a collapse in the support ratio, that is to say, the number of working people to the number of retired people. And this is going to put incredible amount of stress on the federal budget. Now, is it an immediate crisis? No. The debt crisis that this is going to drive is something that's going to happen somewhere between 10 and 15 years from now. But you know what? We need to get ahead of it now. If we want to fix this problem in the way that causes the fewest distortions in the short run, the way that creates the least amount of harm to the residents of the United States, retirees and working people, we have to get in front of this now and start dealing with it. But no one in DC could possibly think 10 years down the line, everybody again is in complete panic, hair on fire, run around screaming nonsensical, about nonsensical crises that don't exist right now. Uh, that's what politics is. And, you know, it's the kind of thing that 10 years, we're going to look back at, at 2019 and go, what were we thinking? Why were we doing that? And I don't know if we're going to have a clear answer. As investors preparing for retirement, we may not have total control over what happens in government in the next 10 to 15 years, but we can control how we prepare and deal with it. This week on the Your Money, Your Wealth TV show, Joe and Big Al are taking us to Investor Boot Camp to get our portfolios and our retirements in shape. 
Watch it online at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. And for a limited time, sign up for our special offer. Get a free copy of the book, Think, Act, and Invest Like Warren Buffett by Larry Swedrow. This book is only available for the next couple of days. So click special offer at yourmoneyyourwealth.com and sign up for your free copy. Now more with Dr. Chris Thornburg of Beacon Economics. So eventually we will have another recession, and it's, it sounds like yeah. you don't think that'll be in the short term. Um, yeah. But what you're referring to in the longer term, whenever we do have a recession, it strikes me that there's just not a lot of tools to put in place to really support the economy the way that we did coming out of 08, 09, or even out of the early 2000s with you know, monetary policy. Rates are, are pretty low. The Fed can't necessarily do quantitative easing again forever. They can't just expand their balance sheet. Fiscal stimulus, you know, is limited by the fact that the budget deficit's already pretty large. So when we do get another recession, what's it going to look like? Because while maybe the excesses in the economy aren't the same as what they were before the last recession, it also strikes me that the tools at policymakers' disposal to counteract it aren't as robust either. Right. Well, I think you're half right. Um, the, the fiscal stimulus part of that, you're exactly right. I mean, we're already in a bad budget situation. And trying to borrow that much more in the middle of a recession is going to be really ugly. So couldn't agree more with you on that. As for the Federal Reserve, I, I would have to completely disagree. Look, quantitative easing is something they can do again. There's not a problem. Filling up the Fed's balance sheet is irrelevant at some level, as long as they're pumping money into the system uh, in order to, to offset deflationary pressures and to make sure that the monetary flows are moving appropriately through the economy. Um, yes, at some point in time, you got to worry about the potential for inflation, but inflation doesn't kick in in recessions. That's not the issue. And remember, even if quantitative easing isn't working very well, you can always go to to the uh, the last but not least uh, stimulative effort of the fiscal of the Federal Reserve, excuse me, which is just basically direct cash infusions into the economy. You know, Ben Bernanke used to be called the helicopter Ben. Because but somebody said to him, well, if you can't use traditional monetary policy, what do you do? He says, quantitative easing. And they said, well, what if you can't use quantitative easing? He said, well, then you fly helicopters around, you throw $100 bills out of them. You know, that's a little extreme, but it gets to the point that you can always stimulate the economy through a direct cash infusion. The Federal Reserve has the ability to do that. What would that mean for financial markets, though? Because it, it strikes me that we've had the Greenspan put that they call it, that financial markets expected Greenspan to come in, and every time there was a sell-off or a slowdown, he'd put a floor under it like he did in the early 2000s, and then the Bernanke put, you know, helicopter Ben, um, and then Yellen and Powell. I mean, if every time that the economy slows, the Fed starts taking what used to be considered extraordinary measures, what does that mean for uh, sort of the structure of the financial markets or for the long-run well-being of the U.S. economy. And, and these may not necessarily be concerns that I personally have, but I certainly hear a lot of clients and a lot of the general public that are afraid that the Fed has too much influence. And if they're nah. single-handedly, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. the, no, cre the cre no. creature from Jekyll Island or whatever yeah. is single-handedly supporting the economy, what, what does that mean longer term? Yeah, but, but first of all, the Fed isn't single-handedly supporting the economy. The economy is single-handedly supporting the economy. You know, one of the things that I think people get wrong about recessions is the idea that the econ uh, you know recession is when the economy's broken, and when the economy's broken, the only thing that can fix the economy is the Federal Reserve or Congress. No, that's not how it works. It, the, the economy suffers a temporary shock, and that shock will work its way out of the system eventually. Economies are self-healing. The role of policy is not is not to get rid of a recession or fix the economy. It's largely to minimize the negative impact of, of the recession on people through the downturn, right? You don't want the recession to get out of hand. You don't want the recession to, uh, to become worse. You don't want people to suffer and lose their homes and starve in the streets. So we have unemployment insurance and we use fiscal policy, we use monetary policy, and we do all this to, to smooth the symptoms until the economy heals itself. I would argue people give way too much credit to the Federal Reserve. I'm amazed by how, particularly in Wall Street, how a lot of the economists talk about the Federal Reserve in these hushed tones of, of awe, almost like talking about a, a greater power, and, and they're not. It's just another institution 
they have some power, not nearly as much as we give them credit for. And, you know, they, they could do some right things to, again, minimize the negative impact. But ultimately, the economy is going to get better and move forward. So the next recession, how bad it's going to be, to be honest with you, is, is less a function of government policy and a lot more of the shock to the system that created the recession in the first place. The Great Recession was so bad because our economy was so out of whack. So much debt, too much spending, not enough saving, a giant trade deficit, vastly too much home building. We were a train wreck of an economy in 2006, no matter how good it looked. You know what? We got through it. As bad as it was, we bounced back in a couple years. Now, the next time, I don't think the shock's going to be that big. I don't think it's going to be that dramatically of a negative downturn. That was truly unusual, and we haven't seen the underlying conditions, the underlying imbalances forming in the economy today that could possibly come close to creating that type of recession again. Let's talk about uh, tariffs. How, how, yeah. does, how does that affect what you just said? Uh, not much, because remember, tariffs are really only on Chinese products coming into the United States. And the Chinese are, have far more to lose from tariffs than we do, and they know that. You know, we end up paying a little bit more for our stuff. They end up having a huge amount of trade diverted from China to other countries, which is a threat to the health of their economy. So one of the reactions to the tariffs has been to allow the yuan to depreciate. They're picking volume over profit, and they're doing so deliberately to play this out, to play the long game. You know, what's amazing is for all the talk chatter of tariffs, there really hasn't been much of a reduction of trade with China. There really hasn't. Because of the fact that outside a few key industries that China is deliberately punishing for political purposes like soy, they've actually continued to buy most of the stuff they buy from us. And equivalently, the depreciation of the yuan has made the sting of the tariffs really not all that bad. And keep in mind, think about a lot of the things we import from China. People don't think about this too much. But let's take a pair of pants. Let's say you walk into Macy's and you see a pair of pants that were made in China. Okay, and I don't know, like say they cost $60, right? What do you think Macy's paid their Chinese manufacturer for that pair of pants? Yeah, a lot less. Let's say uh, 15 bucks. Uh, probably six or seven. Got it. So, again, does a 10% or 15% increase in that $7 pair of, of pants really have a dramatically negative influence on our economy? There are pressure points. I'm not, I'm not minimizing things. There are parts of the economy that are a little more sensitive to this than others. But... Overall, again, it's one of those issues that's been so highly overstated. It's a fascinating game. Candidly, I'm glad Trump has finally said enough is enough. Maybe he's doing it for the wrong reasons. He's focusing on the trade deficit as opposed to all the other things they're doing. But I'm glad he's doing it. So in a sense, um, I think we should be less worried about the short run on that and more pleased about the potential positive long run effects this and have by forcing China at some level to start to play nice. Dr. Christopher Thornburg, great information as usual. Any other final thoughts before we let you go? Yeah, don't don't mind the miserablists, right? Don't don't listen to all those pessimistic folks who just are finding yet another reason to tell you how terrible things are. Times are pretty darn good. We have a lot of long run issues our economy has to deal with. It's sad that we can't appreciate how good it is right now and get down to the very real business of tackling these long-run challenges. Chris, I, I love your message. We love having you on every time we can. Hopefully we can get you back. Thanks so much for joining us today. Pleasure to be here. Dr. Chris Thornburg, who founded Beacon Economics, really enjoyed your info. And I love the positive spin. And I remember talking to you a few years ago where even things were tough and you still got us through it. So I appreciate that positive spin. Read the transcript of this interview in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Share the episode via email or across social media and subscribe to the YMYW podcast so you don't miss what's coming up. Our friend Jonathan Clements returns to YMYW to talk about market risk, rebalancing, and Roth conversions. Tyrone Jackson joins us from The Wealthy Investor. And as always, Joe and Big Al will be answering your money questions. Scroll down and click Ask Joe and Al on air at yourmoneyyourwealth.com to send in your question or comment as a voice recording or an email. We have uh, Ross up, uh, up the street here in L.A. Sure. He wrote in. 
He goes, I continue to enjoy you characters whenever I get a chance to watch and learn. So he continues. He can, yeah. It's it wasn't just once. once. It's just it was, one that's shot. Twice at least. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right. So he he goes on with um, some interesting ideas here. So bear with me as I go through some of this stuff. Okay. I'll break it up because it's somewhat long. Yeah, there's a lot here. All right. He's got a few things to ask. So Ross says, I have a few things to ask if you get the time. Well, Ross, the time is right now, my friend. Uh, first... I bought a residential house, so he bought a primary residence. He bought it, Alan, for seven hundred and seventy-seven thousand dollars. It's worth. Can I round here? Yeah, you do can you mind round. if I round? <laughs> I don't mind. Okay, you can round to eight hundred. So yes, he bought a residential house for eight hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, and today it's worth one point three. Okay, so it's gone up about five hundred thousand. Five hundred thousand dollars increase. Okay, that's pretty good. That's really good. Not bad. So then he goes. People talk about this as some kind of profit, but it cost me twenty six thousand dollars per year for the mortgage, another five thousand dollars a year for insurance, and ten thousand uh, dollars property damage. Or is that you think property? Well, it's probably a combination taxes? of insurance and repairs, maybe. Okay. Well, five thousand for insurance. You forgot about oh. taxes. Too. Oh yeah, ten thousand yeah, right. property. I'm guessing taxes, unless he got property damage. Damage. I don't know. Ross, what would you do to your house? Tough on his home. <laughs> I know he's <laughs> just he's beating it up. <laughs> so in four, fourteen every, years, every year he's yeah. got, got a full time contractor. <laughs> well, I put, my, put my fist through another wall. Can you believe it? Yeah, listen to these characters on this stupid podcast. <laughs> they made me so mad. Yeah, I'm so mad. I'm just hitting my walls. I got ten thousand property damage a year. <laughs> these idiots. <laughs> so, uh, so in fourteen years. My house costs forty one thousand dollars per year for a total of five hundred and seventy four thousand dollars. All right. So he's saying he bought his house for eight hundred, it's up one point three. Yeah. Okay. So that's a five hundred thousand dollars increase in overall market value of the home. But he's like, wait a minute. Did I really make five hundred thousand dollars? Because yeah, I, I spent all I spent all this money. Yeah, so I, I you know, I'm paying the mortgage, I got property damage. <laughs> It's, it's crazy every year. <laughs> every year I got damages, <laughs> uh, and, then, and then some insurance. So he's like, "Well, I I spent five hundred seventy four thousand dollars. So prior to Trump, uh, with interest write off, you could save a net two to three thousand per year. So let's say thirty or so thirty thousand, thirty thousand or so." Um, Increase. What? So, so he's. Well, I can't. Uh, so he, he, here's what he's saying. He's, he's, he's saying it cost him five hundred seventy-four thousand, but he saved about thirty grand of taxes. So his net cost is about five hundred forty-four. Okay, that's, that's what he's saying. But that's not what he wrote. I know, but I, okay, I but, had to re- read it a few times okay. to get it. All right. It seems to me your house is only a savings account. In this case, a loss. Am I right on this? So what he's saying is he spent five hundred forty-four thousand, right, to own this house for fourteen years, and he made five hundred thousand appreciation. So he's out of pocket forty-four k. So why is home investing such a good deal? Yeah, that's what he's saying. Well, you have to consider the alternative. Yeah, so, it only so, cost him forty-four thousand dollars to to live, live for fourteen for years. For fourteen years. <laughs> so think about rent. So I already did the math. So three thousand dollars rent per month. Just if that's what it rents for. Well, at an $800,000 house? You would think so. I'm, three, I think three that's grand? conservative. Yeah. Yep. So $3,000 a month for 14 years is 500000 So that's what it would cost you, right? $500,000. That's out of pocket. That's out of pocket. Versus forty four. Yeah, versus 44 is exactly right. So there's your answer. I mean, you, you have to compare it to renting. You have to compare it to, to the alternative. The alternative. Now, if you live in a On tent, the street. tent by the river, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then I agree with you. Uh, second, I have, since age 32, I am now 59. So for 17, this guy writes very uniquely. Right. I like how yeah. it's like. Right. It's You're like, following it really well. I was totally expecting you to this, follow over uh, yes. this one. I was like, man, I feel like I'm in, I don't know, the 1800s. <laughs> how do you get that? The, I don't know. He kind of puts things Did in he weird, say, weird. He drove his, rode his horse up to the. Or it's like, or it's, no, it's like, or like Yoda. 
You know how Yoda speaks? Okay, so he has since Backwards. age 32, he is now 59, for 17 years put all his retirement in Vanguard 500 Index Fund SEP IRA. It's a SEP IRA. Yes. Um, and he let it alone. Good and good bad and times. Good and bad times. Good. Right. I, I agree with that. It is now worth one point. Oh, now one, it's worth. 1,650,000. Okay. Or, or is it 1,600? <laughs> I think it's a million six fifty, but I wanted they, to leave that. Period, Hardly so enough to retire on. Sixteen one point six million. Hardly enough to retire on. Well, that's about what seventy thousand of income, something like He's that. He's fifty nine right now. Okay. Yep. All right. So, what do you guys think of a self directed IRA where you buy turnkey property for income for life, uh, noting some percentage will not be rented? Uh, it seems in California, everyone is trying to buy in rent. Um, I looked at some guy named Morris, and he invests in deals with 50K properties and gets $500 per month. So in essence, a 10% return, and you have the property versus taking 4% each year out of my SEP IRA. So at this time, 66K per year, while uh, you hope Remainer continues to grow at least 4% or more. What do you got there, Al? <laughs> um, I'm not a big fan of that. No. And, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Well, first of all, uh, I guess, well, you're in Los Angeles. So uh, these $50,000 properties are not in California. Uh, they're probably in Texas or maybe Tennessee or somewhere like that that has better cash flow. He's buying properties for $50,000. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's some other place besides California. Uh, so it's it would be an out-of-state ownership for you, or maybe it's Morris that does all the work. So you have no control over your investments. I've seen people do stuff like this. I have seen a few people happy. Many people that have done this have not been happy because they have no control over it. The market changes. The properties can't be rented. It's it can be a nightmare, or then you can't sell the properties. You can't have debt on the properties. So it, it's I, I I wouldn't go that route. You can't spend a property. You can only spend the cash flow. And if the cash, what if you need a new roof that year? Well, you don't have cash flow for two years because you got to save the money for the roof. Well, he, he, he usually gets ten thousand dollars of property damages. Yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> for his, his insurance. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe he shouldn't. Maybe it's better that he doesn't manage yes. the properties. So. so, no, I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, not, I, I, I like real estate. I would invest in real estate outside of your retirement accounts because you get depreciation benefits. Uh, if you pass away, your beneficiaries get a step up in basis. There are all kinds of benefits outside of a retirement account. Inside the retirement account, it's just a big hassle, in my opinion. So, um, Han is converting this to a Roth work, and I don't think I qualify. Well, Ross, you can always convert, and anyone qualifies for a Roth. So I think he's specifically asking you about this IRA that he would put real estate in. Yeah, can yeah, he can still convert. Yeah, you, yeah, 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 yeah. you can. Uh, and it, it, it depends. More, it depends on the um, uh, on the custodian that that's holding the account. Whether they'll let you do a partial conversion or whether they have to convert the whole property. Maybe you can convert a fractional interest. I would have. I've seen that before. Yeah, I've seen that before too. But I wouldn't necessarily presume that's true for all custodians no. because it's it's a level of complexity that I'm not sure they get paid anymore for. Right, 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 right. Um, but if it's a fifty thousand dollar property, maybe you just convert, convert one whole, of the properties. That, yeah. You convert fifty thousand. Now you got the one property. That would be off. the cleanest way to do yeah. it. Yeah, as long as the custodian allows it, the answer is yes. You can do that. Yeah, because you're not going to a typical Vanguard Schwab for this. You're going to someone that specializes in self directed IRAs. It's yeah. a totally different animal. Right. Um, so he's thinking about buying in Colorado and Texas. Um, so well, first of all, if it's, if it's in your IRA, it that doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. But secondly, if it's not in your IRA, it doesn't matter because you're a California resident and you will be taxed in California. You will pay tax in, in Colorado too. You just get a tax credit in California for the tax you pay in Colorado. So uh, and then he finishes up. Anyways, just some thoughts. Appreciate your input. I continue to enjoy your show until he listens to this. I'm sure <laughs> I would like to retire soon, but always worried I won't have enough. Isn't that the truth? We all um, kind of have that same worry, Ross. Um, I have one daughter taking her nursing boards, congrats, and another daughter, second year law school. Um, congratulations there. Son's a realtor. That's where he's getting the real estate bug. Right. Uh, my wife and I are doing everything we can to get them into a moderate condo to start their life before we focus on ours. 
I uh, always been kind to respond to my inquiries, so that's what we're doing now. Uh, you know, Ross, you got a really good handle on all of this stuff. I mean, you're 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 dabbling in, you're doing the research, you're listening to clowns like us. Um, you know, I think, you know, I think he's good, man. Yeah, I did. I did. I too. mean, he's worried. He's 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 definitely taking some um, some actions. So we wish you uh, the best. If you want more information, Ross, you can always go to yourmoneywealth.com. That you can, Ross. As a matter of fact, Big Al Clopine did a video about buying real estate in your IRA, and I've posted it in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com, along with our latest blog post on real estate investing 101. And stick around, Ross, because you're getting all your financial questions answered today in just a few minutes joe and big al will address your annuity question as well and since your money your wealth is for everyone we are taking questions from people other than ross too all you got to do is go to yourmoneyyourwealth.com scroll down to ask joe and al on air and send in your question as a voice message or an email and the fellows will respond right here on the podcast and hey if you're subscribed new episodes with answers to your email questions will automatically download to your device Hmm, how about that emails you say let's go to uh ken uh from san diego okay so ken from san diego he goes being considerably risk adverse i'm serious about your opinions related to fias which stand for fixed indexed annuities um, or some people call them equity indexed annuities. But I think the SEC or someone got upset and they said, no, it's, you can't put the word equity, equity into it. Yeah, they used to be called EIAs, right? EIAs, yeah. I remember that yeah. acronym. Uh, specifically, the growth options where you just park cash and let it grow. I'm considering parking a million dollars from my recently retired wife's 401k for about five years while I'm still working. I'm looking at a fund that will give a percentage bonus on the initial balance, but it's seeming a bit like too good to be true. I realize I have to pick the index and the upside is clipped, but appreciate your thoughts. Okay, this, Ken. Uh, wow, I'm just going to sit back and listen. Well, here's this is how it's sold, yes. all right? It, it uh, sounds great. Okay, so, all right, let's talk about it. It's, it's a... It's a fixed annuity. So let's start there. Let's just start really basic. What a fixed annuity is, is that you are giving your dollars to an insurance company, and what you receive from that insurance company is a fixed rate of return. Fair enough? Okay. Like a CD, Al. You, you, you have CDs. I do. Most people don't know how this stuff works. So let's say you go to the bank and you want to purchase an FDIC-insured CD. So you give... U.S. Bank, whatever, $100,000. They're going to pay you 2%. Right. All right? What do they do with that hundred grand? they are not putting it in the vault and waiting for you to come back in six, eight months, or 12 months, or whatever the term of your CD is. They're investing it. Yeah, they're trying to make more than the 2% that they're paying you. And they're making a lot more than that in most cases because they they're, might they're, have... They're loaning money out for Yeah, whatever. boats. Yeah. Right? A boat loan, car right. loan, car, credit yeah. cards. A house, a house loan. House loan. Four and a half percent. Right. Credit yeah. cards, 24 percent. Right. A boat loan, 12 percent. Right. Right. Whatever. So they're lending the money out. Right. And so they're trying to reach higher than that 2 percent. That's called a spread. Right. And so when, pe- when, when people hear that with the banks, they go, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Right. Insurance companies, when it comes to fixed annuities, do the exact same thing. But, you know, they got a reserve. So you give your money to the the big insurance company. They're going to give you a fixed rate of return. So I could buy a fixed annuity. The difference between a fixed annuity and a CD, um, in layman's terms, is that the interest on a CD that I receive is taxable each year that I receive it. In a fixed annuity, it grows tax deferred. So let's say I get a five-year, 2% fixed annuity. That 2% on my principal, I'm not paying taxes on until I take the income out of the annuity. Right. Okay? Annuities also have special terms or um, is that you have to be 59 and a half to get the money out or there's a 10% penalty. Every interest is taxed at ordinary income rates. All right? Now, that's a fixed annuity. They're like, okay, well, that's great, but that's boring. You know? Yeah, that's, that's, I want a better return. I want something cooler. I want something more like market returns. Yes. But I don't want to lose money. Right. And so how it's sold and how it works are two different things. I'm not 
opposed to how it works as long it's disclosed appropriately. But like right here, Ken, he's saying, I'm getting a bonus. So what he's getting himself into is a fixed indexed annuity. So it's a fixed annuity, and they're going to promise him a bonus. Give us $100,000, we'll give you 5% right up front. Yeah. Now no questions asked. Get, got 105. Yep. All of a sudden, 105000 bucks. Or it could be even a bigger bonus. Maybe it's 10%. Right. Now no. you got 110. Now you got 110, 18%. Day one. We've 100. seen that before, yeah, too. Yeah, we have. We 18 have. grand right up front. Yes, we have. How do they do this? Yeah. This is great. It's like a free toaster when I go open up a checking account. Right. Expensive toaster. <laughs> yes. So how the fixed indexed annuity works, and there's all sorts of different flavors. I have no idea, Ken, what you're buying. If you want to show me the contract, I'll be more than happy to you know, dive in a little bit deeper for you. Not me, but someone in my firm will. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be clear. Let's be clear. Is that you're buying into, how do I say this in language? Like a zero coupon bond, right, with a call option. Okay. Uh, whatever index that he chooses. That's in layman's terms? Kind of. <laughs> That's why I had to think about it for a second. <laughs> so, because it, let's say it, it, I'm going to, because on your fixed index annuity, it says, well, how about you can invest in the S&P 500? Or yeah. how about the Russell 2000? Sure. How about the Wilshire 5000? Oh, wow, now I'm a stock market investor. Right. But I'm never going to lose money. Yeah. Because how it's sold is that you can get stock market-like returns with no downside risk. Yeah. Right? So if the stock market does 6%, you'll get 6%. If the market does 8%, you'll get 8%. But if it goes down 20, you don't lose a dime. Yeah. Now that sounds great. That sounds perfect. Yeah. Who doesn't want that? Yeah. Now what's the problem? Of course, I mean, it doesn't work that way <laughs> because you have to look at the fine print on these products. Most of them, they'll have a participation rate. Okay. So let's say the market does 10%. But your what what is your participation in it? Maybe you only have a fifty percent participation. So now the market does ten percent, but my participation is only fifty percent. So I'm getting five. Then there's also caps with how much that you can make. Um, maybe it's a point to point on a month to month basis or year to year basis or things like that. So you have to look at that. Maybe I can only get two percent per month. On a fifty percent participation contract, right, and the market goes up in one month and it's flat it goes the rest up, of the year. yeah, it goes up eight percent in one month. Right. Well, I got a fifty percent, right? So that's four plus the cap on it. Well, it's two. And you're like, well, what the hell? The market's up ten. I only got two. Right. That's how the insurance companies make all the money. Right. Because you got a bunch of guys out there saying stock market like returns with no downside risk. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to give you ten percent up front to boot right. and a free toaster. <laughs> What do you think? <laughs> Where do I say? Yeah, because you get all these conservative investors that are now retired that they're looking at their statements because they need to live out this stuff. He's retiring in five years. And I like how Ken goes, well, I want to take my wife's money and put it in this thing. <laughs> I'm not going to put my money right, into it. Right, sure. <laughs> so if they would say, would you like a fixed annuity that will probably tie you up into this product for 10 years, right? You have to look at well, how long. How long am I going to be in the contract? If they're giving me an upfront bonus, you know it's longer than 10 years in most cases. Right. Right? Make 7 to 15 years. So now I'm stuck in this product. Now I try to take the money out. I got huge surrender charges because they're lending that money out. The, the, the insurance companies are doing all sorts of stuff with it. Now, you can take 10% Oh, yeah. Per that's year. what the brokers are telling them or the right. insurance agents. Well, yeah. why would you want to take it all out? Come on, Ken. This you probably is, he's, a great you only want to take four percent out per year, don't you know? The right. four percent rule? <laughs> right. Why well, are you taking out ten? You know, we'll give you ten. So there's a lot of really bad sales practices behind it. But if it was like, okay, here's my commission, you give me a, he's gonna get a million bucks, all right? Guarantee the commission on that product at a bare minimum is what? I was going to say seventy to 100000 It could very yeah. easily. I don't know what a minimum is, but that's what I've seen. You know what, right? Yeah, 7 to 10%. It yeah. could, it, we've seen higher. Right. So you got 10%. I'm going to put a million bucks. You're paying the, the commission on that is hundred grand. Yeah. We've seen a little bit higher than that. Today, we have. Right? 18% commissions we've seen. We, 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 tr we try to go help this guy comes in 90-some years old or 87 hey, he, years old, he, right? He's in his mid-80s. Yeah. Mid-80s. 
couple million dollars in like seven different contracts. And I was like, well, why do you have all these? Well, it's diversification. No, bull. It's all different. Right, break points and stuff like that. And every contract was 17 years. Yes, and it went to different, this this broker went to like different types of, um, because one insurance company is going to be like, uh, you're putting this in, this gentleman's entire net worth in this annuity. <laughs> this is illegal, sir. <laughs> and he's That's by, why he's like breaking it up and he's putting it all over the place. Right. I mean, there's a lot of crooked cr- it out it, there. It out right? there? Yeah. There's, right, yes. okay, got it. Um. Anyway, so what's the what's the advice? I guess I guess just be really careful. Know, know what you're getting into. Yeah, because you're right. If if it sounds too good to be true, Ken, what do you think it is? If you want the the skinny and just say, okay, I'm willing to to tie up my money for it anywhere from let's say ten to fit, or let's say seven to fourteen years. I don't know what contract he's getting sold here, right? It's a million bucks, or maybe it could be annual liquidity. If that's the case, well, then that's a totally different story. Maybe there's no commission in the overall FIA, but if there's a bonus involved and there's... Yeah, I've I'm, got to I'm, believe. I'm, I'm guessing. <laughs> I'm just guessing. That's a pretty good hunch. I would agree with you. So without me knowing anything about what product that you're thinking about going into, that was kind of with a broad brush. Sure. Um, just buyer beware. Think about you know the pros and cons of everything because... It sounds to me that he only knows the pros. Right. Ken does not necessarily know. Well, the he cons. knows there's a. It's the upside is clipped. He is aware of that. And he knows that it sounds too good to be true. True. I realize I have to pick the index, and upside is clipped. But here's how it's sold. You know, if the market does twelve, I could get you eleven. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? That sounds pretty good. Hey, so we can't get you the full upside of the market, but almost, almost. So I don't know. Hope, hopefully that helps, Ken. But if you're a conservative investor um, and you want, but to be honest with you, we've seen just straight fixed annuities perform better than some of these indexed annuities or fixed indexed annuities. It depends on again participation rate, your points, and you know caps and all that other stuff. So, all right, let's see. Ross from Los Angeles. Uh, he writes in too in. Uh, same same uh, type of question okay. that we did from Ken. Okay, he goes, boys, I need your intelligent thoughts. Uh, what do you think of a fixed annuity within your IRA that pays an average of three to six percent with no loss ever, and a cap of ten percent when market does well, no fees? Really value your opinion since it appears so many financial advisors don't like annuities. Okay, well, this is just another way to explain what we just went through. So, on average, three to six percent, <laughs> which well, means three point two. Well, look at this, Alan. If I'm looking at the the expected rate of return, let's say if if Ross here, if I uh, let me put my little Larry Swedrow hat on, okay, right? Can and you, can you talk like Larry? N- Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on a second. I gotta shut the door. The dogs. Dog the, 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 the dog. Yeah. <laughs> it's so, every time we call him. That's what we get. Oh, I love Larry. It's wonderful. And um, but if you think about it, so he's getting sold this now. All right, average three to six percent in a fixed annuity, averaging three or six percent. Come on, we're at interest rates right now. What's a ten-year Treasury at? Uh, it's two? two, two and change. Okay, so the of course the the insurance companies are going to pay you three to six, and it depends on what index he selects because it's like well when the market does well well what market are you referring to Ross is it the S and P five hundred is it the Russell two thousand is it the international is it the uh, you know there's so many different types of indexes but let's just assume he's going to select the S and P right S and P. Price earnings ratio is pretty high. You look at the earnings yield on that, right? The future expected return of the S and P is probably around three percent. It's it's lower than usual because because it's so high right now. Right. So when you have prices are high, your expected returns are going to be lower. Yeah, and I think a lot of people don't understand that when 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 prices are low, future expected returns are higher. Right. It's it's kind of almost the opposite of what you might think. So. He's saying three to six percent. I would find um, if that were the case, 
Okay. If you could get on average three to six percent with zero loss, yeah, in a cap of ten, why the hell wouldn't you? Yeah, it sounds great. I would do it, but it, it's not true. It's not going to happen. It's just don't. I I just don't think that. It's not like financial advisors don't like annuities, right? Financial advisors that are fee only fiduciaries don't like how annuities are sold. If they said, all right, here's a fixed product that you're stuck in, and here's how it works, <laughs> right? And you're probably going to get two – I mean, what's a fixed annuity? I mean, can we look it up on, um, I don't know, fixedannuity.com or something like that? What's What, what are they paying now? I mean, yeah, what's a standard fixed annuity paying? I would guess, what, two and a half? Well, Three? well, no. Well, they don't say it that way. It's, it's no, no, a, no. This is a fixed index annuity. I'm just saying that if I wanted to buy a straight fixed annuity. No, but I'm saying, but they talk about it in distribution rate, which is also getting your own oh, money oh, back. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's where I'm get, going. Oh, no, that's an immediate annuity. Right. So so that that might be 4% or or even 5 7 But it, they're giving you your own money Principal back. Principal back. Right. Right. So I would just, you know, if that was the case, Ross, then, yeah, by all means. But I... I, I just don't think you can average over the next, let's say, ten years, three to six percent in a fixed annuity. Um, why would they cap it? So the the caps at ten. So if the market does nine, you, I mean, a market does eleven, you get ten. How, I mean, so uh, again, you yeah. gotta always look at well, the fine print. Yeah. So we we don't know the details here, but but wouldn't wouldn't it be safe to say, Joe, that we've looked at a lot of these, and have you found one that you would recommend? A fixed index annuity? Yeah. No. Ever. Uh, there's things that I hear. It's like, okay, well, here there's, um, you know, no surrender charges. You know, and they say no fees. It's b- BS. There's lots it's, it, of fees. It's not a fee. It, 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 it's something else. It's called a spread. Right? It's different. It's just different terminology. They're making a ton of money. You're not getting any dividends from the stocks because they're buying options on the stuff. And it, there's, it's not like an, a, a per se fee that you see. It's a spread, and there's commission. It's just all. Uh, it's just word games. Anyway. All right. That's it for us. Hopefully you enjoyed the show. Uh, Andy, wonderful job today. Thank you, Jeff. Big Al, good job. Thank you, sir. You got it. We'll see you guys next week. Show's got your money well. Special thanks to our guest, Dr. Chris Thornburg from Beacon Economics. For the transcript of today's interview, the link to his website to hear his previous YMYW appearances, and for links to share and subscribe to this podcast, visit the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. For your free two-meeting financial assessment with a certified financial planner, just click the free assessment button at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. Oh, buckle in. Here's the derails. So I'm golfing the other night because I could get out at, you know, 6 o'clock and you can still play about nine holes. Right. That's right. (laughs) Right? You can. And so I actually was able to get 18 holes in in about an hour and 10 minutes. How'd you do that? Because it was just me and a buddy, and we were the only guys on the course. Every shot was perfect. You just I'm went really up good. <laughs> no, I mean, you can fly through. I mean, I'm not sitting there, like, mule bobbing for putts at 7.30 at night. <laughs> you know, what? I, I've never understood the whole bobbing thing. Yeah, oh, you, my you know God. I that? played this golf tournament the other week. Holy, well, hey, Rick, the Bob says it's about two cups <laughs> to the left. I'm like, what the? Who's Bob? <laughs> Shut your mouth. You, you do see a few pros oh, doing that. But God. They're, they're old school. They're getting off the, you know, and, and you know, they'll walk off the, the green and the look on this side and that side. I, and, I know, like, and then they still four putt. It's I like, like <laughs> I like Brent Snedeker. He walks up to and he puts it. If ah. he makes it, he's good. But anyway, the, the only people on the course we played over here at Riverwalk. Yeah. Right? Okay. <laughs> at dusk. Yeah. Oh, my God. There's a village of homeless people in the backwoods Oh, there. I can imagine. By the, living by the river. Yes. Just I was, like I told yes, you. Exactly. You can live there. I mean, It's a lot cheaper. <laughs> yeah, right on the river, right on a golf course. You could pick up a few bucks on the corner. <laughs> oh. you, hold, you hold up a little sign that says, I need money. God, that scared, it scared me. It's like bladed one right in the woods. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's sorry. made you feel bad. Yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to. Leave a couple bucks for medical? Yes. Just ruin this guy's tent. <laughs> so...
Um, all right. All right. Where were we? Okay. Oh, I so guess we answered Ross, that question. Forty-four. Are you following this, Andy? I yes, I am. Okay. All right. You want to go golfing sometime? No. Okay. Not with you. You want to? Oh wow, that hurts my feelings. Why? Because you kneel, Bob. You wait. For, she li- she likes to bu- plum bob the yeah plum bob or whatever that is <laughs> fifteen p- practice swings go up to the ball straight blade into the woods. I've heard I've I've not played golf with our own Brian Perry, but I've I've heard he uh, takes about twenty practice it, swings. It's something it's something interesting to see. Yeah, it is very interesting to see. So I, if you if you're in a hurry, it's just a little tip. No, it's like you know sometimes you go on your knees or like you bend down when you're like. Lining up a putt. Sure. He does that when he lines up a drive. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. There's a little bit of slope up there, about 200 yards, <laughs> and then he hits it about 40. Yeah. So it's it's to each their own. Yeah. I think, okay. I think it looks great. It's good. Huge special offer today, though. Huge. Huge, Al. It's a uh, it's a book, isn't it? Yep. Larry Swedros playing the winner's game. Think, act, and invest like Warren Buffett. It's all free. Just got to give us your name and uh, phone number address so we can send it to you. So if that scares you, then don't call or don't click on the button because then our guys just sit there and try to get a hold of you forever (laughs) and you never respond. So it's like it's a book. It's a free book. We're giving it away. People email in their phone number. It's like we don't know how to mail it to a phone number. Um, Hey, never got that book. Well. Can I have your address, please? Oh, Whoa, no. no. What are you going to do? You're Private. Gonna... <laughs> are you going to come over? No. <laughs> Earl, I'm not coming over. 